Hello and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. I'm very excited to have Dr. Leo Gallant here today. I know him personally. I know a lot of people who go to him. And he's really a, a great doctor. And you know, we hear so much discussion about Eastern and Western medicine. And what's great about Dr. Gallant is that he's brought the two together because what he really cares about is wellness. You know, we, we talk about sickness all the time. But what about wellness? That, and that's what he focuses on. His latest book, which is The Fat Resistance Diet, isn't just about losing weight. It's also about inflammation in our bodies. Because one of the things we've all learned over the past couple of years, if you read anything at all on the health pages, is that inflammation can help you, if getting rid of inflammation can help you prevent cancer and heart problems and I think just about everything else. So. Um, uh, also, I'm proud to say that Dr. Gallen is annually, always annually, on the, on the America's top doctors, so I'm very excited to know you. Um, okay, so we're going to dig right in, unless you have something you want to say first. Have I made any mistakes yet? No, you haven't made any mistakes. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so the first one is from Loretta, and she wants to know what vitamins do we really need, especially as we get older? Well, first of all, what I want to say about vitamins is they should never be used as a substitute for a really healthy diet. Vitamins should be in addition to a healthy diet, and there's a right way and a wrong way to use vitamins. Oh good, let's so know, let me let's go learn. Into that. Okay, uh, the wrong way is to take the attitude, well, everybody should take a multivitamin, can't hurt, and it's gonna ensure that you don't get deficiencies. Um, the reason that's the wrong way is that, number one, Vitamins are not necessarily safe, and different individuals have different needs. With regard to Loretta's question, which I think is a really important question, and it's one that a lot of people ask, there are certain things that most women need to think about, vitamin D and calcium being at the top of the list. But for everybody who's getting older, vitamin B12 is an issue, and sometimes folates. And you mean I'd like, like folic to, acid? Well, I want to say something about that. Okay. Because, you know, folic acid is not really a vitamin. It's a synthetic B vitamin. It's a synthetic pre-vitamin, sorry. That <laughs> folic acid is a synthetic pre-vitamin that is chosen because it's cheap and stable. Your body has to convert it to the real vitamin, which is called vitamin B9, or also known as reduced folates. And what you get in food is vitamin B9. It's the reduced folates. What, what food do you get it in? Um, you know, for vegetarian foods, spinach is my favorite source. It's very rich in it. Two cups of spinach a day will give you all the vitamin B9 that's required. And you like people to take it if they don't get that much for spinach? Well, I like people to try and get it from food. Uh -huh. And, you know, for people who are not about to be eating lots of leafy green vegetables a day. There are alternatives. Liver's not a bad source. But um, you can also make smoothies. Actually, what I like to do is, I like to make a smoothie with a cup of spinach in it. Um, oh. Some oh, it tastes great, wait a second. This is a, this is a recipe that I put together oh, good. not so long ago. But you, some frozen blueberries, some green tea, avocado, uh -huh. some spinach. Yes. It really tastes delicious. You can add a little bit of banana if you want to sweeten it. Right. And you get plenty, you get all your, you can get all your folate from mm -hmm. that. So you don't necessarily need the supplements. The point I wanted to make about taking folic acid is your body has to convert folic acid into the natural folates that you would be getting from food. Not everybody does that very well. And the older you get, the less efficiently you do it. And there was a study done which looked at what happens when you don't do it well. What happens is you get high levels of something called unmetabolized folic acid in your body. And that was associated with immune impairment in, in menopausal women. So I'm not a huge fan of just supplementing uh, with B vitamins, so, so for example. So how do we decide what vitamins or what supplements are good for us? Do we need a doctor to tell us that with blood tests and so forth? The blood tests and doctors can help. Uh, I think you should, should start by looking at your diet. I think everybody should be trying to consume nine servings of vegetables and fruits every day. Leafy green vegetables are especially important for folates. Uh, the 
brassica vegetables like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. And fish. And, and fish. Fish for minerals like selenium and iodine right. uh, and magnesium. Nuts and seeds for trace minerals. So if you're eating a diet in which you're getting nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, fish f so two you or mean four eat times nine a week. times a day? No, <laughs> servings. It's oh, serving. nine servings. So I what's see. a serving? A serving might be a cup uh -huh. of something, or uh -huh. let's say a, a, a medium avocado is one serving. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now a lot of people are not going to sit down and eat that many vegetables. Right. That's why I like smoothies and I like soups. Uh -huh. so you can put a lot of stuff right, right. into those right. and, and it makes it really easy to get right, that number. Right, right. No, I, I, I agree, that's, that's great. Okay, this is from Nancy. Dr. Gallen, there's a lot of confusion and controversy about diets and the guidelines seem to always be changing. Can you please shed some light on the paleo gluten-free diet versus the vegetarian <laughs> and low carb versus low fat? Okay, well, in two minutes. Yes, <laughs> Let's okay. start with the first one. What's it, it's really all individual. Uh -huh. It's totally individual. As far as paleo, paleo is really a kind of romantic delusion. I mean, you, you can't really eat like a hunter-gatherer right. living in the U.S. <laughs> today. And, and what the hunter-gatherers, the Inuit in Alaska are eating, is totally different from what the Hadza in Tanzania are eating. Because right. paleo, by its very nature, is local food. It, and so even if you're it's indigenous in Manhattan. Yeah, it's right, yeah. right. And so even if you're eating um, only fruits and vegetables and you're not having any grains, and paleo really is about no grains, no sugar, no dairy, mm -hmm. no beans. You know, nothing that you couldn't just right. um, gather or kill. Right. Um, I mean, even if you're eating those, they're, the apples that you eat are not the same is the apples that originated 4,000 years ago in right, Kyrgyzstan. Right. You know, I mean, they're selected, they're grown on farms. It's, right. it's a whole different thing. Nonetheless, there are people that feel better when they eat that, that way, when they mm. cut out the grains and the dairy products, and almost everybody feels better being off sugar. Right. That's an individual decision. You have to know your, your diet. Right. You have to know your body. Right. And I've seen people who thrived on a low-carb, high protein diet, following the basic kind of paleo guidelines. And then I've seen other people who crashed on that kind of diet. Their energy sagged and they did much better as vegetarians, uh -huh. including eating grains. Right, I love grains. <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know you do. I really do. Uh, okay, oh, and the, and the difference between low carb versus low fat. Um, Again, that's that same individual thing. I'm not a huge fan of low-fat diets for most people. They're very hard to maintain. They, you wind up, when you're trying to do a low-fat diet, you usually wind up having a lot of carbs that raise your blood sugar, whereas fat tends to satiate your appetite. Mm -hmm. And there are essential fats that you really need to stay healthy. So I, I'm, I what rarely are put... What okay. are the essential fats we okay. need? Okay, well, there are two categories. They're called omega-3s and omega-6s. There tends to be an excess of omega-6s in our diet because of the widespread use of vegetable oils. Omega-3s tend to be low and deficient. And you get them from oily fish, you get them from walnuts, you can get them in, bean, in certain mm -hmm. beans mm -hmm. like navy and kidney beans. Flaxseed is a really good source. And let me ask you, when you say about the oils, you say there's omega-6 that we don't really want and it's in a lot of oils that we eat. So what are the oils that you like us to eat? I mean, I'm an Italian, so we eat <laughs> olive oil. I, I love olive yeah. oil. Um, extra virgin is the best. Right. Because in addition to the oil, there are all these great things from the olive plant uh -huh. that are still in the extra virgin uh -huh. oil, the antioxidants and right. phytonutrients. Right. The, um, when it comes to... Um, safflower oil, safflower, sesame oil. I, you know, sesame is okay. Uh -huh. It has a lot of antioxidants in it. I don't like safflower oil uh -huh. or corn oil. They're mostly depleted of antioxidants and they're very high in omega-6 fats, which can contribute to inflammation. Yeah. This has been studied a lot. Right, right, yeah. I, mo for the most part, I don't really like isolated oils for uh -huh. patients. I like them to get it in the whole food. Right. So like flaxseed and chia seeds right. are great vegetarian sources. Yeah. And what you do is you grind them fresh, 
they go great in a cereal or on a salad do you do this or in or a does smoothie. Your wife do this? No, I Who do. Does I the actually, grinding? I do the grinding. Actually, <laughs> I like doing the. She grinding. does the gathering. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she does the gathering. Sometimes we do it together. That's nice. <laughs> Well, that's even a nice long marriage, so I'm sure it is. Uh, this is from Michelle. Dr. Galland, are there particular foods that people should try to eat to maintain a healthy body inside and out? So you were saying the vegetables, the leafy vegetables, fish to get the omega-3s. Is there anything else? Grains, no. how do you feel about grains? You know, I think grains are a very individual decision. They're not essential for health. Quinoa and that stuff? Quinoa is okay. Uh -huh. um, it's certainly higher in protein. I have some concerns about the ecological effects in the planet of, of our switching to a quinoa-based diet here in North mm -hmm. America, yeah. what that does to the people that are growing it in South America mm -hmm. and who depend on it. Um, I think that nuts and seeds, if you're not allergic to them, are an essential component of a healthy diet. They're high in fiber, they're really rich in nutrients. Most of them have beneficial fats. My favorite uh, snack is almonds or walnuts and an apple. That's great. I love that snack. Right. And it's I really had my husband on it, which was really difficult. It, it really do. sustains you. That's yeah. what I used to take for lunch when I yeah. used to ski. Yeah. Instead of sitting in a cafeteria and having some uh, Yeah, heavy or meal. buying a Milky Way on the way out <laughs> yeah, of the airport. Right. This is from Lynn. Dr. Gallen, summer's almost here and I really want to get into shape and eat properly. Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> what are some particular foods that I need to avoid for all around wellness. So, uh, do when you got when you want to get into shape, you're really talking about getting rid of the fats in your diet, right? Right, right. I, I mean, frankly, I don't think it's different if you're trying to get in shape, shape for summer, <laughs> or if you're trying, or you just want to stay healthy through right. the winter. Right. I think that we start with a concept of white foods are not particularly good for you. I'm not including cauliflower in there. Right. <laughs> okay. You know, but um, flour products baked goods. If you want to lose weight, the fastest way to lose weight is to cut out the sugar, cut out the alcohol, or at least cut it way down, and stay away from bread. Wet from bread. Bread is a killer. I know. Pasta is a killer. I know. You know, it, what I, I mean, it's, yeah, I know, but bread, it's pasta real. and wine, that's what we <laughs> ate. <laughs> but you know, right. when I, I had to gain weight for a movie I was doing, and uh, but with our friend Elaine, who was doing a movie, right. and, and the producer, Julian, uh, called me and said, I've been looking at the dailies, and you're too thin. And I said, well, what do I do? And so he said, well, my doctor says, mm -hmm. you just eat two pieces of bread with every meal. And I did, and I gained nine pounds. Right, oh I mean, yeah. it was amazing. It'll... I mean, it, it looked good on the screen, but I couldn't wait <laughs> to stop it, because I really, I was getting to be a tub. But it was amazing how quickly I put that weight up. Yeah, bread is a two bre real... Two pieces with every meal. Uh, this is from Justin. During the day, I find myself craving something sweet or salty. Can you give me some tips on some good ways to handle these cravings? Well, there are really healthy foods that are sweet. And um, one of my favorites, by the way, for people who just have to have something sweet, especially after eating or after dinner, frozen organic cherries. Well, they're really? so sweet, they're inexpensive, they're low in calories. You let them thaw. Uh -huh. and, and the key is, the key with frozen fruit, and you know, of course, fruit of any kind is good, and I like fresh whole fruit, but if you really want the sweetness, if you get some frozen fruit, and I recommend organic, it's pretty easy to get these days, right. you let it thaw for about two minutes. So you want it cold and pretty firm, right. but you don't want it frozen. Uh, the frozen cherry, organic cherries that have thawed a bit, it's just like eating ice cream, so you can but without that, the sugar and you without can buy the that cream. At Whole Foods or someplace? Sure, Whole Foods yeah. has it. Yeah, oh, that's great. This is from Rebecca. I've been told and read that the food you eat affects your brain and your moods. Is that true? And then what food should I avoid and what foods should I eat? And are there any supplements that improve brain function? Well, the answer to both of those is yes. <laughs> There are supplements that help, and food has a definite effect on, on your brain. I mean, your brain is the most energy-dependent tissue in your body. Um, four seconds without oxygen, and your brain shuts down. Right. So it, it, there's, it's, it doesn't store anything there. You need to constantly be feeding it. That's a great way to learn about that. 
That really is. Yeah, yeah, and and it that's. It doesn't store anything. It doesn't. There's no. That. Yeah, there's nothing stored in your brain. Right. It's all neurons. Sure, there's fat there, but it's not fat that you want to digest right, right, and right. use. So it's totally dependent on what's coming from your body. Uh huh. And it's very much influenced by what's coming from your body. Now there have been studies that have looked at the impact of diet on brain function, and it's complicated. But the basics are: the good news is that what's good for your heart is for the most part good for your brain. What's good for your tissues in general and your joints is good for the brain. So we're talking so about an, vegetables and fruits. Right, an anti-inflammatory uh -huh. diet. Uh -huh. And they've pe researchers have looked at the effect of like a typical American diet of fast food and added sugar oh on mood and and it's really bad i mean right. it contributes to depression mm -hmm. you get people off that kind of diet and their mood really improves right and for your brain function are, are there supplements for memory i mean i've read so many yeah. and tried so many things <laughs> for a long there, time there was something oh i forgot the name of it started with a k that was supposedly the supplement for memory well there isn't the supplement yeah. the best researched and the most effective in my experience is, is a form of lecithin called phosphatidylserine. Uh, standard lecithin, which has some good effects, is phosphatidylcholine. This is a little bit different, and there are numerous studies showing that this improves not only a brain function and memory, but immune function. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my first choice go-to. And the other are omega-3s. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I like to combine the phosphatidylserine with DHA, which is the omega-3 that most impacts on memory and wow. brain function. Well, we've got to put that up. That's important. Yeah, I think it's really that's important. That's really important. Because everybody's worried about their memory. I mean, yeah. You know, oh, sure. I mean, it's memory a, it's is... You're 23 and it starts to go. <laughs> this is from David. In your opinion, don't you think if you have enough vitamins and minerals in your diet, such as fruits and vegetables, you won't need to take vitamin supplements, especially when the vitamins are not even FDA approved? I would say that that may be true, but the issue is how do you know you're really getting enough? If you're eating nine servings of fruit and vegetables a day, if you're eating four servings of fish, especially oily cold water fish a week, if you have plenty, plenty of, if the vegetables that you're eating include not only leafy greens, but um, dark orange and red vegetables and the brassica vegetables, you know, the cabbage family of vegetables with right. broccoli and cauliflower and onions and especially green onions. Yeah, sure, you can be very well nourished right. if you don't have another kind of health problem. Even if you're doing that, you may not be getting enough vitamin D. I mean, we're in New York, outside of the summer months, unless you're, even if you're outdoors, right. you're not gonna have an adequate right. amount of vitamin so, D. So, so the vitamins that you think should go along with a good diet would be vitamin D and calcium for women and omega-3s mm -hmm. if you can take it. Yeah, mo for the most part I think supplementing, and it could be food-based right. supplement, supplementation. Right. Mm -hmm. I think most people benefit from getting more omega-3s right. than they would be getting even on a, a very healthy um, U.S. diet. Right. A lot of women will need some extra calcium, um, but I don't believe in high doses. Mm -hmm. About 500 milligrams a day of seem, calcium, of calcium oh. seems to be where the benefit levels off. And I don't generally recommend 1,000 or 1,500. Wow. Uh, and there's been some backing off on, yeah, on that high yeah. dose. There are a lot of people, by the way, who need magnesium especially if they're stressed. Uh -huh. um, noise stress causes your body to lose magnesium. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Uh, this is from Eva. As a woman in my 30s, my mid-30s, what are some of the healthiest things to eat? Well, that's the same as what you've been it, saying. It's the same thing. The one thing that women who are menstruating need to be aware of is their iron intake. Uh -huh. So they may need more, uh, more meat, for uh -huh. example. Now, uh, so are you saying after a woman stops menstruating, she doesn't need as much iron? Oh, yeah. Once you stop losing blood every month, uh -huh. you become essentially, from an iron perspective, like a man. And I don't think you should, I don't think people should routinely be supplementing with iron. There are a lot of people who suffer from iron overdose, uh -huh. and, and that's due to a genetic predisposition. Right. But unless you've been tested, you don't know if you have that. Right. And about 1% of the population in this country 
are susceptible to that. Right. I mean, that's, you know, yeah. a couple you get of million people. From not enough iron. Right? Not enough iron will cause anemia. Too much iron causes inflammation, heart damage, can contribute to diabetes and cause liver disease. So what foods have iron? Well, the most iron-rich foods are the red meat and liver. Uh -huh. And, um, but there iron is, there's a lot of iron in supplements. Uh -huh. So the only people that should be supplementing with iron are people who are iron deficient. It's safe in children for the most part because they're growing and they need a lot and they use it. And it's safe in women who are menstruating for the most part because they lose it every month and in pregnancy. Outside of those specific situations, unless there's a definite iron deficiency, I don't think anyone should be taking iron. Oh, well, iron. that's great. That's great. That's for us to learn that. Um, this is from Michael. This is interesting. I wonder if you can even uh, give a <laughs> cohesive answer because it sounds like a big answer. How do you decide if your patients need an Eastern or a Western approach to their illness? Well, I don't generally make it an either-or situation. People who have a well-designed disease, people who have a well-defined disease that has a specific treatment that's really indicated, I think should get that treatment. But even if you're getting a medical treatment that is known to treat a particular disease, you still have to think about your overall health, your wellness. And the thing about the, the Eastern perspective on health is that it's not disease oriented. It's oriented towards correcting imbalances. And sometimes the treatment that you're getting is actually gonna create some imbalances. So I, I always look at both of those things. Uh -huh. How well balanced is this person? Uh -huh. Diet, lifestyle, environment, mm -hmm. in terms of supporting overall health? Mm -hmm. And is there a disease that requires a kind of specific disease-focused treatment? Would you say that if we're uh, pretty well, those of us who aren't sick, thank God, mm -hmm. Uh, there still is an Eastern approach that we should be looking at, which is the idea of vegetables and fish. Is that is that the Eastern approach? Uh, well, it's, that's my nutritional approach. Right. Eastern, um, there isn't one single right. Eastern medicine approach. The concept behind all of the Eastern approaches is the idea of establishing balance. I see. Finding out um, what's out of balance in your body. And you can be very well and still be very imbalanced. You're just strong. You have a way of over, you know, of overcoming that. Right, right. And so I think especially if you're a well person, that approach that is based on let's create harmony and balance in uh -huh, your body right. to maintain your health, I think that's a very Cause, important. Because I always think of Western medicine as too many antibiotics and too much dependency on on take a pill for this and take a pill for that and... Uh, yeah, well, me you know, Western medicine is disease-oriented. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's define the disease and then here's a medication that'll treat it. Right. And sometimes that can work really well. And antibiotics, you know, have saved hundreds of millions right. of lives right. over the years. But there's always a price to pay whenever you take that right. kind of effect, that, that kind of, whenever you take that kind of treatment. So, if a person is strong and well balanced, they'll bounce back from the side uh -huh. effects. Right, right, right. And also, you don't always need an antibiotic because oh. you have a cold. No, I mean, that's kind of the antibiotics are inappropriately used, uh -huh. and they're certainly inappropriately used for respiratory infections mm -hmm. because it kind of is easier and people want it. But right. they don't. There have been so many studies that have been done that shown that antibiotics do not shorten the course of an acute respiratory infection, uh -huh. unless it's real pneumonia. Right. Even for bronchitis and acute sinusitis, uh -huh. they don't add anything. Doesn't do it. Okay, so uh, let's see here now. This is from Lisa. What are the health benefits to using an infrared sauna? Uh, saunas are really good for detoxification. So the question is, you know, do you need to detoxify? Well, most of us probably do. And um, saunas also, if you're on antibiotics for uh, an infection, like Lyme disease, for example, saunas have been shown, heat has been shown to enhance the effectiveness of the antibiotics. So for a lot of my patients with Lyme disease, I'm recommending saunas 
in conjunction with the antibiotic therapy. But is infrared sauna Well, that's different? one. Is that a different kind of sauna it, than you see at the gym? Infrared is one type of sauna that it, it, it's something you can do at home. You can have a home infrared sauna. So it's mostly, from my perspective, it's mostly about having better control over the temperature, being more portable and convenient. Uh, but the bottom line is it's the heat. It's yeah. not the source of the heat uh -huh, that matters. Uh -huh. uh, this is from Drew. I know you wrote a book about the four pillars of healing. Can you tell us concisely what those four pillars are? I can be very concise, <laughs> even though it filled a whole book. Okay, they're basically four things that determine how well, how healthy you're gonna be and how well you will recover and heal. The first of these, the first pillar, are relationships. The social network that you're part of, the relationship you have with other people and with your doctor or other health pra healthcare practitioners, um, which that's just vital and that feeds us more than anything else. Oh. The second uh, pillar is food, but I, I use a term in the book called dieta, which is the origin of our word diet, but it's a Greek word and it means more than just what you eat. It's your whole lifestyle, it's your pattern of rest and exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and so the regulating the way that you live mm -hmm. and the way that you eat, not just looking at what you eat, yes. is, I mean, those, that's really important. Mm -hmm. The third is the environment. And um, environmental causes of illness are rampant. Um, you know, it depends on the type of environment, but I see so many people who are made ill by, uh, by chemicals in the environment. I mean, we live in a very chemical, chemical world. Mm -hmm. Every 2.67 seconds, every 2.6 seconds, there is a new chemical isolated or, or synthesized. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a huge number. So, right. so paying attention to the chemical environment in which you live, mold is another factor. Mm -hmm. I see so many patients who have been made ill because of indoor mold exposure from wow. leaks and yeah, floods yeah. and or HVAC systems that mm -hmm. aren't functioning properly. And the fourth pillar is detoxification. It's strengthening your body's ability to get rid of uh, toxins and a lot of that starts in the gut and so a lot of the work that I do in my practice and in my writing and teaching has to do with the GI tract, the bacteria that are growing there, the leakiness or intactness of the linings and, and ways of shoring that up. And there and are tests it so strong. people can know what that is like inside oh, yeah. their own body, right? There are tests that can be done, but basically you're gonna know if you're toxed. Because yeah, yeah. when you're toxed, you tend to be bloated and swollen, you tend to feel yuck yeah uh, you know I mean even if you don't have a specific you have a disease you can have a lot of gas and bloating yeah constipation or diarrhea mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important to pay yeah. attention to those kind right. of symptoms yeah yeah this is from Julie hello Dr. Gallen and Marlo hello I'm 44 years old with severe stomach issues they say I have bad IBS I try to treat it one doctor says to use high fiber the other says I shouldn't what is best for me to do? I'm at wit's end and tired of the pain. Also, what else can I do for the pain? Well, first of all, what is IBS? Irritable bowel syndrome. Uh -huh. And the symptoms of that are abdominal pain, constipation or diarrhea, gas and bloating. Diet has a significant impact on IBS, but it's not the same for everybody. And so, to some extent, it depends on what your symptoms are. If there's a lot of gas and bloating, the diet that I recommend you check out is something called FODMAPS avoidance. How do you spell That's that? F as in Frank, O, D as in dog, M as in Mary, A, P as in Paul, S as in Sam. FODMAPS avoidance is avoiding high FODMAPS foods, which are for foods that readily ferment in your gut. And the whole issue with irritable bowel syndrome for most people in my experience, and I've been dealing with this for 40 years <laughs> right. and thousands of patients, is it's the relationship between the bugs in your gut and the food that comes in. And if you think about your GI tract, it's a tube about 35 feet long. Food comes in at one end, 
refuse goes out at the other end, and at the end, the, at the other end that doesn't have the food, there are 100 trillion bacteria, and they play a very important role in the health of your body. The goal, one of the goals of the GI tract is to keep the food away from the bugs. So the factors that allow that to happen are, number one, stomach acid. Your stomach, if it's healthy, produces a lot of acid. That kills 99% of the bugs that get into your stomach from food or from, um, from your mouth, for example. Um, the second thing is the digestion and absorption of nutrients as they go down the small intestine. So that by the time what you fed yourself gets to the large intestine, most of the nutrients have gone into your body. And what's left for the bacteria are things like fiber that help a healthy um, bacterial population to grow. Um, and motility plays an important role in keeping that flow right. going. Keeps the food, the food coming in, the bacteria from coming back up. But, so FODMAPS so helps you. you. So what's yes. a FODMAP? FODMAPS diet is a diet that avoid, avoids the foods that are readily fermented by the bacteria that get into your upper gut. That includes cutting out wheat. It includes limiting some of the vegetables that you eat that contain um, starch that's like wheat starch, which is what, hard for people, to, what's one of those? artichokes, oh, uh -huh. even garlic, uh -huh. onions, I mean some healthy foods. Well, what are, about olives and things like olives that? Olives are fine. Yeah, I always consider that a fermented thing. Well, uh, right, the yeah. foods that are fermented outside your body uh -huh. may be fine on a FODMAPS diet. It's the fermentation that I goes see. on in your gut. Uh -huh. you, you know, think about what happens when you're baking bread. Right. Okay, well that whole process yes. of, you know, leavening right. can go on in your gut. It can make you pretty uncomfortable. Right, right, right. Certain fruits, apples and pears, are a problem. People who are sensitive to these foods often have a hard time with sugar substitutes like oh. sorbitol and yeah, xylitol. Right. So that's a long answer. No, no, but, but it's, it's a really, it's, it's so, there's so many people that are troubled so by this. So you must be against like soda pop. Right? Yeah. Well, soda pop well, I mean, has Cokes no benefit. Well, I mean, is it bad for your gut, though, is what I'm saying? They're bad for your gut. They're bad for your body. They encourage weight gain. Yeah. I mean, it's... But it's every, I mean, I know people who drink Diet Coke all day long. Yeah, I know. It's, they're bad for, it's bad for your bones. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, I'm really yeah. uh, opposed to the use right. of those. I think we've run out of time, and I want to be sure that I did not... Uh, uh, okay, well, let me just hit... I, just, I hate to <laughs> sure. leave people without... An answer. Josh wants to know what are your thoughts on the fasts that are uh, so in vogue now. Do you believe in fasting? You know, if you fast for one day a week, it may be okay. Uh -huh. I don't like prolonged fasting. It depletes your liver of important antioxidants uh -huh. that you need for detoxification. Juice fasts, on the other hand, that is, it depends on you what you're, you're juicing juice with. Else. It depends on what you're juicing uh, right, with. Right. Green juices, green smoothies. Uh -huh. Those can work out, can work okay. I use them with my patients. Carol wants to know, are pro probiotics helpful to over -he well, health? Probiotics can be very helpful. There's no perfect probiotic. There are a thousand species of bacteria in your intestinal tract. If you take one or 10 or 12 strains as a pill, that may or may not have any impact on right. the thousand species that are living there. Right. So it's that, like finding the right diet, finding the right probiotic is a path that you have to take yourself. No one can tell you this is the right probiotic. I have one that's called women's probi probiotic. And what is that? <laughs> I'll buy anything it's, to say yeah, women's probiotic. Right. I mean, it's meant for me. Sure. Well, I, I think, uh, oh, one last one from Doug. Do you re recommend any supplements for f mood enhancing? I, you, you know why I this is those, important? Yeah. Is because there's so many people that are, are taking antidepressants. I mean, this entire generation takes Prozac. I've never seen such a thing. When I was growing up, nobody took Prozac. Now my friends' children all take Prozac. Yeah. It's, so, that's so a, a terrible The number thing. one supplement that's been shown to help with depression are omega-3s. And it's the, it's the EPA in the omega-3s that has the effect, not the DHA. DHA is good for memory. EPA has the effect on mood. And the dose that was used 
was 2,000 milligrams a day. So that's something that I recommend for all of my patients suffering from depression. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm out of time. You're just so fascinating. You know the answer to everything. And thank you so much for coming. It's great to you're, be with you today, You're a wonderful Marla. man and a great doctor. Thanks, everybody. You just got a terrific education from a really smart guy. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.